Okay. And how many of you use TensorFlow? TensorFlow? Okay. Uh, so then I'll start from the beginning. <laughs> what is machine learning and why we want to use it? <laughs> so the main point of machine learning is that there is some problems that we actually don't have an exact solution or we don't want to code the exact solution and want to machine to figure it out. That's the very part. Most of the problems fall in few, few classes like prediction. You want to predict some behavior of people or some uh, force of nature. Uh, you may want to classify some objects or some, again, behavior like fraud. There's a recommendation problem where you want to show people some items they probably more probable than they're going to buy. Uh, and a few others like clustering where you want to group objects but you don't actually know what are the properties they have that actually define the grouping. So to kind of define this in more mathematical term is we have some function can we uh, like usually we'll represent it as code but we don't actually know what the code does. But what we have is some kind of input and outputs of this function that we observe. For example, pe people go to your website and click on objects that are data people use. Uh, you know what they see, you know what they click on, but you don't know what the function they use to actually do this clicking. Uh, the same thing with clustering, uh, there's a classification. You have some uh, objects, you know that people classify them, for example, images, you know they classify this as a lion, this as apple, but you don't know how to do it. Um, this is what we want to use uh, machine learning for. One of the good parts about machine learning is it becomes better with more data, big data meetup. Um, when you have a hard-coded solution and you try to write some code that will do it, usually it becomes worse the more code you write, the support part. Um, the more code you write, the harder to support. If you have a flexible machine learning model, you can just uh, learn the behavior you want and it will just become better with more data because it just reinforces the same. So to just give you some examples of machine learning products and kind of where you can apply it. And I'm from Google, so I'll show some Google examples. Um, for example, uh, Inbox and Gmail are using classification to prevent spam to get it out of your inbox. Uh, they're using classification to, class, to define which emails are important and which are not, just by observing which emails you read more, which emails are not, and they're cut right away. Uh, for example, Google Translate, I mean, it's a magical uh, piece of software that pretty much doesn't have any other solution because you actually need some other language. It's a hard problem, nobody knows how to do it. But we do have machine learning models that actually learn from data to be able to translate from, I don't know, 120 languages now. Amazing. Google Photos recently introduced, it manages to classify images across I don't know, thousands or tens of thousands of different uh, classes. And you can now search for baby photos and it finds photos with babies. You can search for cats or mountains. Um, you may have seen that over time, while you're typing on, on your phone, the predictions it shows are actually becoming better. It's because it actually learns what you type after what. For example, you type in some, your own address in the phone, it will actually start suggesting you the street name and then the city, because it knows how it goes. Um, and a number of other products leverage machine learning in different ways and try to bring it to you in kind of a product way. But we are here building different products outside of Google as well, and we're interested how to use this. Um, and also, what kind of challenges are there usually with more data? So, machine learning has been around, uh, and there's kind of few main ways to do it. There is frameworks in Spark, there is uh, Scikit-learn, and a few other options, and uh, there. For people who use them, they know where uh, what they do good and where the limitations are. I just want to highlight a few. Uh, one of the kind of
kind of limitations is with more data, it's not just the amount is more, but there's a different variety of data that you have. Um, on top of your regular kind of floating numbers, you have images, you have text. Um, you may have some kind of geographical data that somehow has this representation inside, but you are not capturing it. You just represent it with these floating numbers. Floating numbers. Um, so the soul is really hard to handle in regular machine learning libraries, and uh, there's few hacks to try to work around it, but uh, they all kind of have not delivered very good results yet. Um, the other thing is, it's really hard to learn many things at once. Imagine you want to predict uh, how, how much fuel will this jet take uh, to fly from one place to another, but also you want to predict it across all the jets in your fleet, right? This is really hard enough. You can predict one, uh, one kind of number at a time, but now you want to predict thousands or millions of things at a time, and it's not straightforward. It's possible, but it takes a lot of work, and the, the models you build are actually not leveraging each other's representation. Um, and the other part is, even though we have a big data, we have also a small data problem. Um, usually, especially when you start, you don't actually have data, or you have very small amount of kind of data that you're interested in, and uh, it's really hard to do machine learning with that. Um, and you may have whole internet of other information, but you don't know how to leverage it to improve your model you actually care about. Imagine you're starting a new app or a product, and you want to recommend whatever you're selling in it. Um, you don't have yet user data clean objects. So how would you how would you bootstrap it? Right now you would just show popular things, but again, they're not that popular because there's nobody else on your website. Um, so if we could leverage the data that we already know, for example, some kind of information about objects themselves, description and images, we could already start learning the model that would predict what users will like better and more. Um, so, enter deep learning. Um, so deep learning is a, kind of a subfield of machine learning. And the promise, the great promise of deep learning is that you actually don't, like it can solve all the problems. It can also uh, remove you from doing a lot of feature engineering, meaning when you have your data in your data stores and uh, um, you do want to learn something from it, right now you would require a lot of ETL transformations to get it into the shape that your machine learning framework actually can take, and then you probably need to transform your target as well to get it in the shape that uh, you need, and then probably need to run a lot of models because you need to run it across various things. All this requires a lot of coding, a lot of pipelines, a lot of maintenance. Um, the promise of deep learning is that you can just give it raw inputs, what you have in your logs, what you have in your uh, user uh, profile or database, and predict some of the targets that you're really interested in, like probability of user clicking on something, and uh, you can use it. Um, I'll show you some examples that uh, kind of will show how this surface in real life. So let's start with an example of that kind of what we have in Google Photos. Um, the input is raw pixels. It's just uh, the color of each pixel. And then the output is the word, like the class of the object or the uh, location of the object on the picture. Uh, we use the very deep neural networks, I'll show you in a second, and uh, it learns this just from showing you a lot of examples. Um, so if I may interrupt, these are sure. examples without feedback. So it is a feedback. What you give your model is an input data. It inputs and outputs of your of what you want to so learn. So you're, you're giving samples, samples where you have pre-classified and then having it induced based upon the example. Exactly, yeah. Because it is possible to do it the other way around. 
which is to give people examples without any feedback. Yes, so we can talk about it in a second, but uh, there's, diff there's different ways you can train these models. Uh, kind of the most successful so far is called supervised, where you actually give it labels. Faster. Um, faster. Uh, and of course, this comes with a price that you need to have the supervised data. Um, but there is also semi supervised and non supervised learning. I'll show you in a sec. So, the other example is audio. You may have noticed your Google uh, now and uh, became better at understanding what you're asking it. Google search. Um, so again, we give it a raw signals that we're getting from a microphone sensor, and it actually uh, manages to write out the character by character what exactly is said, and we run some post-processing to it and the things in the proper way. Um, so you have the restaurant. Uh, this is a more use of the special thing. Okay, Another one is search. We actually have used the same models in search, uh, where for each query and documents, we manage to predict how probably you click on this document. Um, again, we are using information that we have. We probably already clicked to uh, learn representations in the neural network instead of writing code. There's been, I think it's announced uh, last year, one of the major improvement on certain search and it didn't require that much code. Um, translation, as I said, Google Translate, training. Um, it understands this word, word meaning in different languages. You can actually, uh, inside the neural network, there's a space that represents the meaning of the word and the phrases and it, and it can go back and forth between um, and one of the like recent advancements and really amazing is actually going from images to user captions. So that be able to see the image, and not just detect an object or a few objects, but actually describe what's going on in the image. Uh, some of the examples are really amazing where it has even some of the common sense knowledge that models usually lack. Um, so how does this look inside? Uh, so for understanding images, we actually use pretty much this. Um, this is a lot of blocks of computation, like Legos, and uh, that's why it's called deep learning, because it's really deep. Uh, and uh, the point of this is that you can actually combine these pieces very, very naturally into these more complicated models. So instead of writing code of how your, uh, kind of, how your system should work, you just define the representation that you want to learn, and then you give it all the data, and it manages to learn all these components all together as an answer. So this actually kind of has schematics for this image captioning, where you feed an image in the beginning, it uh, transforms it into useful features for, for uh, classification, but then you put the recurrent neural networks, which is uh, what we use for text processing, and it manages to predict what this image is, is, is uh, what is what is on this image. Um, so all those components can be used individually. So for example, neural network, recurrent neural networks are used for document classification, where you need to uh, predict sentiment from the document. And then this image is used for um, classifying objects and determining what objects are in the image. But if you're putting them together, now you're getting a novel model. Another point is uh, pre-training and kind of semi-supervised learning. This is where uh, we have a lot of data that is unlabeled and um, or labeled by, like, you can kind of figure out some way to label it automatically, but it's not actually what you want. And what you want, but you don't actually have that many labels. That's a small data example. So what you can do, you can pre-train this some model on the, this unsupervised set, and then leverage the representation for something else. The example here actually uh, shows you a space in which we represent words. It is projected to 2D, it, like usually we use at least uh, 500 to 1,000 um, vectors, so this is just a 2D. 
But the idea is that in this space, you can, you, each word is kind of positioned somewhere in the space, and they have some relationship between them. Uh, one of the interesting parts is this relationship, if you do some math on them, you can actually get, uh, for example, if you subtract uh, woman minus man, it's equal queen minus king in this space. And the same thing, like, for example, with the plurality. So this representation now, we, we can train, for example, Wikipedia, where we don't have any interesting labels. Um, and then we can leverage it in our model, for example, sentiment analysis, where we have, I don't know, 100 labels. Uh, and it will leverage what we've learned about words and language to, to learn a model from like, relatively small amount of labels. Uh, that's kind of how you break out of this I don't have any data problem. Um, so actually, from example before that, this Google map is actually pre-trained on millions of images and then trained on only 30,000 for predicting the capturing. So this is trained on about 30,000 labels with the pre-trained model of millions. And that's kind of, you can start combining these components that you pre-trained and building more interesting models. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about TensorFlow. Um, so what is TensorFlow? TensorFlow is actually a numerical library that allows you to define your computational graphs and uh, kind of run them. In some sense, it's not that different from what Hadoop and Spark are doing under the hood. But the way it was designed from, from the get-go was to enable uh, updates to the, uh, pretty much have a state for each of the nodes that you define. So in MapReduce, you usually don't have a state. You just process each record at a time, you transform it, and you pass it forward. Here, you have a state, so when, you, when your record goes through, you can actually use some of the state to do something, and then you can update it later. So this naturally allows you to do machine learning, because machine learning is about updating uh, the weights of the model. So here, just a simple example, including some inputs, you are multiplying your input by some weight matrix, adding a bias, and applying nonlinearity. So what this does is just actually a simple logistic regression uh, that computes, and then when it gets to the uh, this line, you get uh, class labels that actually were in your input. So it's a supervision you get, and you compute the gradient. Gradient is what kind of tells your model how wrong it is. And then you can update your variables that are here uh, to pretty much become more fit to what you're trying to do. So by running this many times, you get your model. Mm -hmm. So let's quickly look at a playground. Uh, TensorFlow built this playground, so you can actually kind of understand what's going on. So what we have, we have different data sets. We have features, so here we'll have very simple features, just x1 and x2, just coordinate. And then we have neurons, one hidden layer, and then we have a, pretty much a classification task uh, to classify between orange and blue. So if you run this, it will start updating this weight matrices to kind of fit our target. So this kind of pretty fast. Um, we can add more layers. And then you will see kind of the point that the layers in between learn more complicated features. And you see it's actually learning uh, kind of if this is a linear linear transformation, so that this one already has some circle things. This is where this feature engineering that you would do before, right? You would do this kind of things to write more features into the model. Now they're learned inside the model. So I, uh, I highly suggest you play with this. It's really interesting. Uh, I mean, you can learn a lot about machine learning in general from this, and we've done as well. Uh, it's playground.tensorflow.org. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Oh, I was just trying to see the URL. Yeah. So, so this is TensorFlow. But one of the great things about it is community. The way it was built is was built for uh, 
researchers, developers, and data scientists. We are really trying to get this community to uh, produce TensorFlow and kind of contribute back to build up more interesting things in this. And communities so far are responding pretty well. We are the most popular machine learning framework on GitHub. And uh, we have a lot of models, and people are trying a lot of things and contributing back. But the point is that researchers work in universities and industry labs to build new models, to build more interesting presentations. And uh, we have data scientists that can leverage this learnings into uh, their daily life. And then developers can easily plug this in into their, uh, our, their production because they can use the same code. It's all highly optimized. So just a quick note about this. Uh, everything, the whole computational engine runs inside C++, but we have, have a Python client so you can easily specify the model. And uh, you can run it on CPUs, GPUs for faster performance, TPUs now, um, and mostly, pretty much on most of the operating systems, you can at least serve the model. So iOS was announced a week ago, um, which means on your phone now you can run that version of that perfectly. Recognize what you about Windows? Uh, Windows is at works. Um, so one of the good things about this is that Google back, we have a growing army of engineers that actually work on it and making it better every day. And there's hundreds of products using it, so it's not going anywhere. Uh, okay, so how I use this? It seems pretty complicated. There's a lot of details. Uh, so let's start with a super simple example. I want a linear classifier. I have some data. For example, I want to classify, I don't know, how many um, out of, let's see, uh, out of, uh, I don't know if you know, Iris data set, for example, flowers. We have three different classes, and uh, we have a few features, like the length of uh, um, their, um, I can have the labels of uh, things, but point is that <laughs> you can uh, define a classifier. There's a few, few different options, but you can do default ones. You can pass your training data um, for a supervised model, train for new steps, and you can now use it in uh, uh, to predict new things, new data that you haven't seen before. This is as easy as it goes. Uh, under the hood, it will build a huge graph for you, run it. Uh, and you'll be able to enjoy that for four lines of code. Even that was a linear classifier, how about we go deeper? So this one is a three-layer, uh, fully connected neural network. That's what gave the deep name to deep learning. This is a huge model. If you think about it, it has thousands of nodes here, 500 nodes here. They all fully connected, a lot of weights. But again, you just define this and you train it. Same thing, one might change. So you can start with linear, figure it out, go from it. Okay, so what about understanding images? You showed us this huge model, you want to do the same thing. So, uh, image classification, a complicated model, lets you view a little bit smaller model. Um, let's say this defines your neural network. So before we were using pre-built neural networks, now you can actually define each layer by layer. So you define a convolution, that's the way actually our eyes work. They uh, summarize information from a retina. And then we define two layers of convolution, we run a fully connected layer on top, and do the logistic, again, just the classifier and for some steps. Now we have a classification model. Of course, like for uh, really good models, you need a lot more layers, and that's why we actually have already pre-built conceptual models that you can leverage. Um, okay, so running the time, so go a little bit faster. Um, let's say you are having a recommendation problem, and you want to show some um, apps that will user probably acquire. So here we have a little bit more complicated model, and here I want to showcase how you can combine these different things. Right? So let's say you have an image, and 
you can run that large neural network to process it. Uh, then you have a description, and that's where recurring neural networks comes in. So you have items and users, and you can also put them in a space in which um, in which you will learn the representation, and that was useful for these representations. So you get all these representations, you put them to a neural network, and you predict how probable this user will buy this item. Um, seems very complicated, um, but image features, text features, uh, items, and users. Let's say four statements that you define the features, and then uh, encoding puts them all together, and neural network prediction run the model. Um, I'm also showing here a simple example of streaming data from various sources uh, through read batch example, which pretty much allows to do the batching of all that's in memory. So, for the sake of time, just a quick glance, the slide will be put out so you can check it out. Um, so, one of the points is that this all scales, and you can run this on many machines. Uh, so, we have kind of a Simple graph, how this scales from one machine to 16 machines to 100 machine, up to 50x, 56x. Uh, you can use it on cloud machine learning or on any pretty much VMs with Docker. Pretty straightforward. As I mentioned, your engineers don't need to break your head how to actually use this in production because we already have a special open source project called TensorFlow Serving. Uh, you will be able to export your model and pretty much put it in in, in a manager and your clients can just use it in production. Um, so to kind of wrap it up, TensorFlow allows you to build a computational framework. <coughs> but TensorFlow there it gives you the ability to build models really fast and try out different things. Deep learning Part of it allows you to get different representations, learn without any engineering. And we're also building out more conventional methods like SVM and uh, uh, decision trees into TensorFlow as well in the coming months. Please check it out, TensorFlow.org for documentation, GitHub for issues and code, hashtag TensorFlow for everything else. Questions? When you go out and you want to do machines, how much you need to pay for this case? That's a question to Google Cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Can you estimate the price? Uh, I, I don't actually know the pricing, so like in Google, we have to do machines. <laughs> <laughs> So it started. It started with actually a project out of, I think Stanford, maybe before it's there somewhere else. It's called ImageNet, where they spend a very tremendous effort to uh, label a lot of images, and then these labels were used pretty much to kind of do the research systems, and then we just expanded the set of labels on more. Part of it, we have a knowledge graph, which is kind of our way of representing entities in the world, and that's. I mean, it's not an ontology per se, but it has a representation for a lot of things and the way to do them. One of the issues, if I understood correctly, that it was the child holding the dog and something that understood the concept of holding. So, this is actually, yeah, the model just learned. We didn't actually give it any ontologies or any semantic representation whatsoever. This is just you give it an image, you give it text, and it learns from that, and then you give it an image, and it just writes back. Wow. That's awesome. One of the traditional problems with neural networks is they're not very good at explaining themselves. So in terms of understanding what the conclusion is here, other than the regression between various models that you've got implicit in your graph network, uh, is there any other explanatory feature? Yes, so uh, part of it is we have those feature layers and actually you can explain what different feature, feature learns in a way the way this kind of shows, right? You can kind of see what this feature learned, right? What this layer learned, what this layer learned. 
So what you're doing is you're drawing conclusions about objects that have been identified, which then become your, your vocabulary for additional work. Uh, in a way. So one way you can use it, you can actually, mathematically speaking, generate what this feature would activate most from the input. So you can see, like for example, in what words this feature will uh, activate the most. So, um, I mean, we can, we can discuss a bit more offline, but there, there's a lot of methods to kind of try to explain it. Of course, it's still a research area of, and there's no like generic way to do it, but for each model, we found some ways. That's why we actually can launch it in Google, because we can launch it in an experiment room. Go ahead. Can you use for demo image recognition? For what? For the demo image if uh, it is not clear what is on the picture, the base on what then? Like for blurred images or? Uh, when let's say uh, the image is damaged, mm -hmm. and uh, you cannot uh, see what is actually on it, but can it uh, guess what all the images are on the uh, I mean, it depends what you train it on, right? If, if you train it on images that are like damaged and there's actually some signal, it will try to pick it up. Um, so it really depends. I'm not sure if models that, for example, train on, on proper images can pick it up from damage right away, but maybe with some kind of tra semi supervised training. It's using some non linear. I mean, it depends what kind of damage it is, right? If you crop off half of the images, then uh, that's maybe harder to reach. But if it's just some kind of linear uh, noise that you added to the image, then I think we had some examples where it actually worked. Because uh, here's, here's also about the evaluation too. Like uh, if the, your model is exactly combining them now. Sorry. And we have um, some evaluation too. Evaluation if this model is. Uh, uh, exactly, uh, combining one not? Yes, so I mean, part, part of the models is always evaluation. And uh, uh, so, what you usually do in kind of not just four line example, you have five this line, which is that eight the model. Uh, and uh, it will show you pretty much as you train how, my, how well you're doing on some other set, right? That's why you have a set that you're training on, and you have some. Have a set that kind of your model hasn't seen, so you don't know it, and then you see how well you do it. So it's all just around the line. Can you write TensorFlow in Go? In Go? So, I mean, definitely not to rewrite in Go. But if you've seen uh, on that slide, I have different languages that you can use TensorFlow from. Uh, point is, we have actually an experimental Go interface. You can find it on GitHub, and you can try it out and give feedback. Um, but the uh, main kind of computational part is in C++. It's highly optimized, uh, and kind of runs everywhere. So. I don't think that's going to change. It just will become better. <laughs> you showed for the front end. Right now there are Python, C++, are there add-ons that you designed? So Go is experimental. Yeah. And then... Uh, so we've played this bar where it uses through, goes through Python. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think some people trying some Ruby. It's it's a little it's a little involved to write another front end language mm -hmm. um, because we need to support a lot of things right now. Mm -hmm. I think there is some work being done to make it easier, but for now it's kind of what we have. If you can have a big all front end, you can. I guess you got on road map. I'm not sure it's an official book, but contributions are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> oh.
So if I get, uh, say, all of my pictures in the last 10, 20 years, uh, probably tens of thousands of them, and uh, you just use my own laptop, which is, say, let's get a high, higher end, uh, say, Apple laptop. Mm -hmm. uh, what would I expect? Uh, Why run the data set with this computer? Depends what what you're trying to learn, but actually, so on my laptop, I run I don't know data set that's five gigs of text, and I'm running like sequence models, and it runs pretty well. The one of the kind of default play play data sets called NIST for digits. It's about ten thousand record, ten thousand images, and it runs pretty well on that too. So um, you should be able to use it. <laughs> For tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of so images. So, say in overnight, I will get a model that can predict, you know, this is me, this is a, my wife, my child. Why would you want to use a smaller subset for learning? I mean, you will use like 80% of data for learning and then 10% for validation. But I think you will need first to actually label every image which one was who. With where? So. <laughs> I thought you don't need to label, right? It can learn anti correct. It, or you better label it. If you want to, it to tell this is you versus, or it can tell you this is a man and this is a woman, but it probably won't be able to tell this is you if you don't tell it. I have two questions. A lot of the examples you share are classification. Do you have a very good example of that regression? Yeah, I mean, when you see like DNN classification, if you replace it with DNN regression, that will yeah. okay. Be... Second one is a happy. I, I believe TensorFlow must have performed very well, but I want to get a sense in terms of many other deep learning libraries out there. So, how in terms of overall accuracy and performance, you see? So accuracy wise, it really depends on how you structure your model. And in some frameworks, it's easier to structure one way versus another. Uh, the speed wise, I think we have some benchmarks that we either match the speed of other frameworks or better at some tasks. Uh, and if we're not, we're getting better every day. And we have an army of engineers doing that. Uh, and then, yeah, for accuracy, that a lot depends. Like, it's really hard to actually compare two models, even if they do the same thing, because actually the method that math under that is implemented differently. So it really depends. You can actually get a better model just by implementing it in TensorFlow, just because like some of the math is done better. 